Everyone is looking for answers. Answers to both the common and the complicated matters of life. Thankfully, the real answers to all of life's questions are found in the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible is the key that unlocks these answers, providing real solutions for this life and the life to come. As you join us today, you'll discover real answers to life's most pressing questions. And you, along with us, can rejoice in the Lord. Galatians chapter 5 this morning, if you would. Galatians chapter number 5. In just a moment, we will begin again looking at the evidences that are ours to display as we walk in the fullness of the Spirit. Hey, we live here in Pensacola, Florida. And in Florida, specifically here in the Panhandle, it is not uncommon for us to get a uh, earth shattering clap of thunder that actually uh, nearly causes you to jump out of your skin. How many of you have ever been, you know, dramatically startled by an, I don't know, an unsuspecting bolt of lightning and then the accompanying clap of thunder? Have you ever just nearly jumped out of your skin because you just weren't prepared for it? When you think about the violence and the uh, shocking nature of thunder, it gives a little context to a nickname that Jesus gave to two of the disciples. Now, I don't know that we would understand all of this about their personality had Jesus not given us some insight because these were men who became dramatically changed. But listen to what the Bible says about these two disciples. The Bible says in Mark chapter 3, beginning in verse number 17, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, and he surnamed them Boanerges, which is the sons of thunder. Okay, James and John had the nickname and Jesus gave it to him. And maybe he smiled a little bit when he said it. So you two, I'm calling the sons of thunder. And, and they like, what, us? And Jesus says, you know what I'm talking about. These are the guys who had apparently something about their nature that was thunderous, fiery, and I would submit, by way of assumption, at times destructive. I, I wouldn't surprise me if they had, I don't know, I don't know that they had motorcycle gangs back then, but I think James and John wore leather jackets and it said Sons of Thunder on the back of their jacket. Okay. This is the kind of person that James and John appear to be, and so Jesus gave them a nickname, Sons of Thunder. I wonder if Jesus nicknamed some of the predominant characteristics that are found in this room today, what would we come away with? There, there is something that is so contrary to what appears to be the immediate fleshly personality of James and John that was clearly not the nature of Jesus and, and is not an attribute of God. In fact, Jesus begins to display during his life on earth characteristics and attributes that are heavenly produced and offered for you and I. To review those, your Bibles are open to Galatians chapter 5. If you need the, the help of Scripture, then please use it. But let's say again together those nine attributes or characteristics that, that combine to make what we call the fruit of the Spirit. You say them with me. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Those are the nine evidences of what it looks like to walk in the fullness of the Spirit. Now again, love, joy, and peace, we've just concluded, those have to do primarily with my relationship with God. And they are the emotional aspects of these evidences of the Spirit. Today we begin in that second group of three. And what we're going to look at when we consider long-suffering, which we'll do today, gentleness and goodness, which we'll do next week, we'll start to see my relationship with others. While the first three were emotional in nature, these three are evidential in nature. They're those three characteristics that should be clearly seen as an evidence of the Spirit in my interactions with one another. 
And then the last three, faith, meekness, temperance, they really have to do with my relationship with myself, with my own walk with God. They are the elemental graces, gifts of the Spirit, fruits of the Spirit, and they're the basics, really, of the Christian life. As we look at these next three evidences, they should be clearly seen by others as being produced in us. As they are seen, they give our faith a public visible legitimacy that is irrefutably visible. That they can't say anything against it. There is no law against such. There is something about the person who is demonstrating this spirit of, of long suffering, of gentleness, of goodness, that another may come away and say, that's not humanly natural, it is heavenly produced. Matthew chapter 7, verse number 16, Jesus said it directly. He said, ye shall know them by their fruits. Today, let's begin by looking at the first of these evidential fruits of the Spirit. Again, that attribute of being long-suffering. Long-suffering. It is the attribute of God that describes him holding back his hand from pouring out his wrath upon mankind. And this attribute is one that he desires to be reproduced in us and seen by others. Now, before we go any further with this, please know God has every right to justly judge mankind. At any point that God does so, he is no less good, he is no less kind, he is no less holy. God has every right to immediately judge mankind. It was Jonathan Edwards that preached years ago the sermon titled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. He rightly explained the holy vehemence that God has against sin. He painted a picture that man was, as it were, dangling by a thread over the fiery pit of hell. And there were men that cried out for God's mercy and his forgiveness before the sermon ever ended, seeking to be restored into a right relationship with God. And it was the sense that God has been and is at this moment long-suffering with me. And he would not cease to be just if God at this very moment flung all those who stand in disbelief into a fiery eternal hell. And my friend, I'd submit to you today that God would be in no wise unjust if at this very moment God removed any opportunity that we have to come to a place of repentance and restoration. But what is it that God so typically does? How is it that God so, so frequently interacts with mankind? He does so with a spirit of long suffering. Now, please note, so that we can understand what it is that we're talking about, patience is not the same as long suffering. I found through the study of this passage that many wanted to insert the word patience. In fact, there are actually many more modern translations that actually use the word patience as one of the evidences, one of the, the fruits of the Spirit. I would submit to you that it's not the same as patience. In fact, even the, the, when we dig into the words, the words do not mean the same thing as we would typically understand the word patience to mean. In fact, patience is that which endures under trial. It does not surrender to its circumstances. Patience is something that just kind of digs in and says, I'm not going to budge. It's well described in James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. The Bible says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. That means various trials. Knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire lacking or wanting nothing. You say, well, what does that mean, patience there? It means staying power, that you can have the ability to stand. That's not the idea, but behind long suffering. If we say patience is, is the, the ability to just wait it out, well, there might be something connected to the word patience, but long suffering it's the opposite of the immediate responsiveness of anger. It gives unwarranted space 
with the hope of eventual repentance. Let me say that last part of the definition again. What is long suffering? It gives unwarranted space with the hope of eventual repentance. Aren't you thankful that God has been long suffering with you? When you start to think about how it is that God interacts with mankind, we see in 2 Peter chapter 3. In fact, if you have your Bible, join me there for just a moment. 2 Peter chapter 3. Here the Bible records the following. 2 Peter 3 beginning in verse 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Do you know what he's saying? Before we read any further, he's saying, hey, be careful because people are going to say, hey, hey, listen, where's the promise of his coming? Everything's just going on just as it always has. Nothing's different. We're submitting to you that while there was a promise of his coming, he's not coming. So in a sense, eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow you die. Now notice a little bit further in the passage, look down at verse number eight. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. What he's saying is time is irrelevant with God. While it matters to you and we work sequentially, God does not. God exists beyond time. He exists above time. He says a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, a thousand years as a day. And then look at verse number nine. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward. Why? Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Why does God grant such space for repentance? Why day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, in a sense, age after age, why does God stay his hand? He does so because he is a long-suffering God, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What he's doing is giving you and I another opportunity to come to the knowledge of him. When speaking to the church at Thyatira about a woman named Jezebel who had taught error in the church, she had practiced error in the church, She herself had committed fornication and she had invited and involved others to do the same. This is a person in the church. When Jesus is speaking to the churches in the book of Revelation, the church at Thyatira, he commends the church for many things. But beginning in verse number 18, Revelation chapter 2, the Bible says, Unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. And then he commends them, and in verse number 21, he begins this. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds." This is how God seems to deal and interact with mankind. Just as he did even with this wicked Jezebel, he said, even though what she did was an offense to my holiness, I gave her space. I did so with those that were involved in her wickedness. Now there is coming judgment, and then he says it again, as if it's another olive branch of reconciliation. This is what's going to happen to them, except they repent. How graciously God deals with us by giving us space. I wonder, even at this very moment, if you or I might be presuming on the space that God has temporarily granted to us. God knows full well our actions and our attitudes that are hidden to others. He is the one that scripture describes, even as we just read, with eyes that are like a flame of fire. 
It is wrong for us to believe that we can continue in sin simply because God is long-suffering with us. All who are within the sound of my voice, God is a long-suffering God. But there is a time when God says, I will because I am just and righteous. I must by my own nature judge sin. I wonder if today there are those who would just do a personal evaluation and say, am I living presumptuously on the good graces and the extended mercies of God? The Bible says in Genesis chapter 6, verse number 3, and the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man. This kind of thinking where we think that I can just continue to live as I am because God hasn't done anything in the past and certainly he won't do anything in the future is the height of presumption. King David prayed this prayer in Psalm 1913. Listen to the words of this psalm. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Here's what David's praying. He's saying, Lord, please, don't let me go day after day after day involved in the same sin, involved in the same presumption, thinking that I can thumb my nose at the mercy, the goodness, and the grace of God, and that God's not going to do a thing about it. Keep me back from being presumptuous with the long-suffering nature of God. And he says, then, Lord, if you'll keep me back from presumption, then I will walk uprightly. Then I will be free from the great transgression. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying, if I continue to take another step away from you, if I continue to live defiantly towards you, if I continue to live thinking I can be immersed in sin and it have no consequence with you, he says, if I continue to do that, Lord, I'm going to be involved in the great transgression. I would submit that David may well have reviewed that psalm later in life and said, Lord, I was presumptuous and I committed great transgression. David's sin with Bathsheba was a series of going through roadblocks that should well have kept him from sin. He should have been out when it was the time for kings to go forth to battle. Once he's, he, he went through that roadblock, he, he finds himself on the rooftop and he sees a beautiful woman bathing. At that very moment, he should have said, oh, now is not the time for me to be here. And then he inquires of her another roadblock. And then an answer comes back. Oh, that's the wife of Uriah. Oh, another roadblock. This, this is a, a man's wife. And, and then he probably finds out, well, Uriah's away in battle. Oh, he's there doing a job that, 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 that is in service to the king. Roadblock after roadblock, David presumptuously goes through. He may well have said, I am the king of the land. God has given me what I will, and, and I will this. And it brought about in David's life a great transgression. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I will walk uprightly. Then I will be free from the great transgression. It may well be that God is being long-suffering with you today. Granting another opportunity to say, Lord, I see the error of my way. You've put so many roadblocks in my path and I've blown through them. Lord, please forgive me. Keep me back from the great transgression. Forgive me for my sin of presumption. Though mankind often raises his fist toward God, yet God keeps the sword of his righteousness sheathed. If it were mine to draw, I may quickly remove it and immediately destroy all who may have offended me, yet not God. God, in his goodness and in his power, sheathes the sword of his righteous indignation, but it will not always remain at his side. There is coming a day when the sword that proceeds, the Bible says the sword that proceeds from his mouth, 
which is the word of God. Remember, the word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And with just the word of his mouth, that sword slays all who stand in defiance toward him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 4, the Bible says this. It says, charity suffereth long. This word comes from the same Greek word that we get our Galatians passage, long-suffering from. A different tense, but the same Greek word. In 1 Corinthians 13, instead of saying, you know, long-suffering, it says that love suffers long. The Greek word is an interesting word. The Greek word for long-suffering is this. It is macrothemeo. Macro. Thumeo. It's a compound word, and so we take the first one, macro. Whoa, this is large. This is, this is big. There's something of substance here, as opposed to micro, like a microchip or something very small. We, we have macro, and then the other part of this compound word is thumos. Thumos. It's the word that we get, get heat from. Like, whoa, wow, fire. This is, this is something strong. And do you know what the word is saying? It's saying that it takes a long time. It's very large before we get to the heat. It is as if we are saying that God himself is long fused. Do you know sometimes we use the expression about another person. Oh, be careful around them. They are short fused. How wonderful it is that almighty God is long fused when it comes to his interactions with mankind. What does this mean then to be long-suffering? It communicates the idea that he takes his time. But there is a time when the fuse comes to its conclusion. The word long-suffering used in our passage, it is always intended. In fact, every time the Bible uses it, the Bible always connects this word macrothemeo. It always connects it to our interactions with people. I, I say that because we're not talking about Well, let me ask it this way. How many of you have ever kicked the copy machine before? Have you ever done that before? You're just tired of the copier? How many of you have ever had a personal interaction with a vending machine that um, it actually resulted in a fight? Okay, have you ever had that before? You know, you put the money in and it just laughs at you. And so you punch the, the vending machine. Okay, it's not talking about that. Personally, I don't think you should get in fights with vending machines, but that's not the point of the word. The point of the word is always connected to individuals. It's not connected to the difficulty of your circumstances. Maybe that's a better understanding of the word patience. But let patience have her perfect work. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials with the copy machine, with with the, the vending machine, with whatever. But why? Because the trying of your faith worketh patience, the ability to stand. But that's not macrothemeo. Macrothemeo says... You're going to have interactions with other people. And now, because God is long-suffering with you, you be long-suffering with those about you. It really is challenging for us to start to look at ourselves in light of the evidence of the Spirit and be able to say, oh, Lord, I'm not doing that. Your Spirit has work to do of emptying me of me and filling me with you. Today, we make heroes out of those who take vengeance. Those who won't be taken advantage of or those who oftentimes we place on the top of the social ladder. We have a go ahead and make my day mentality. However, this fruit produced by the Holy Spirit is more than just patience. He defines it as self-restraint when faced with provocation. A long-suffering person does not retaliate. A wife does not say, I'll teach him to say that. A husband doesn't say, fine, two can play at that game. A church member doesn't snub another because of some offense intended or maybe just an offense perceived. An usher doesn't speak poorly of a church member because they demonstrated an attitude of entitlement. A teacher doesn't retaliate with a parent because of an unwarranted accusation. A teenager doesn't reveal something about another because that friend revealed a secret shared with them. 
It means we don't taunt another in traffic because they act in a far less than Christian manner with you. Essentially, we are acting in a way that gives space. We're acting in such a way that we don't now, because they started something, we are going to finish it. We don't allow another person to dictate our attitude toward them. Think about how a precarious situation we would be in if God allowed our attitude toward him to dictate his attitude toward us. What peril would we be in? What hopelessness? What a position where God would not give us space to grow, space to learn, space to repent, space to to be more evidentially filled with his spirit. What a position we would be in if God simply responded to us like we act toward him. This attribute prevents God from immediately destroying all of mankind, which he could righteously do. In his love, he patiently waits for men to come to him. He even woos them. He he gives now these tokens of his love. He gives this common understanding that God is good to all. He gives very specific understanding that God is good to me. Again, in 2 Peter 3, 9, we looked at earlier, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Short-fused, long-suffering, how vitally different they are. A person who just immediately responds versus a person who says, no, I'm going to give space and I'm going to give a lot of it. That fuse is going to take a long time to burn until I do. Okay, now think through some of the Bible examples of those who had every right to respond, but they did not. Again, I I used him as not such a great example. Let's use him as a good example. He, He becomes, in a sense, the every man of Scripture, and that again is David. David was a man who consistently gave Saul space. He's the guy who goes out and he's introduced to Saul. He's thrust on the national spotlight. He is already the anointed king. He already as a boy has been anointed the king, but he hasn't yet taken the throne. And so he goes out, he faces the giant Goliath, and and immediately David is thrust into the spotlight. Now Saul is a little concerned about that spotlight because they're coming home. They they throw a grand parade for David. Everybody's out and and they start singing songs because they defeated the Philistines and specifically the Philistine giant. And Saul loved the first song, the first verse of the song. He's kind of getting into it. You know, he's Saul, Saul, Saul has slain his thousands. And Saul, he's clapping along. He's singing with the crowd. And they got to the second verse and David... David is 10,000. And when they got to the second verse, whoa, they said, Saul, what, what, did you, what, the words were Saul has slain his thousands? Oh, yeah, yeah, Saul, Saul. And David is, is 10,000. And from that moment, Saul begins to eye David. He's looking at him differently. And now he's looking at David through a filter that is not accurate. And by the way, church, be careful to not ascribe motive to people of which we cannot know. Actions do speak, but motives are hidden. They're matters of the heart. The, the, the Bible says that, that, that man looks on the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. God sees motive where you and I cannot. Well, Saul ascribes motive to David. He wants the throne. No, 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 no. David was only there to exalt Saul in his throne. But things just continually digress. Saul blows up. On multiple occasions, he takes a spear while David is playing music in his presence. He throws that spear at David, and David, whoa, wow, he just avoids it. Finally, David is is running for his life. On two different occasions, Saul comes very close to David. David's hiding to consolidate what it is that happens. In 1 Samuel chapter 26, David finally reveals himself. He had snuck down into the middle of the camp and he had taken Saul's spear and his, and his canteen and he'd gotten a long distance away and, and he goes a long distance away, he, he shouts down to Saul. And actually he, he played with Abner, Saul's 
Saul's captain of the guard, Abner! And they, they woke up and, what? what? Uh, Abner, you left your king unguarded. And he holds up the spear. He, he holds up the, the canteen. And Saul hears the voice. David, is that you? My son, David. Now, do you know what long suffering is going to do? It's actually going to shame the person who now realizes I have been taking advantage of someone else's long suffering patience with me. And you know, Saul says, David, here's what he admits David, you are more righteous than I. You've been upright, you've been good. David, I will no more seek your life. Now, unfortunately, David didn't believe it, but scripturally, that bore out to be true. Saul no more took his, his chosen elite band of soldiers on a hunt for David. Saul was done with that. Do you know what won out? Long-suffering. It actually shamed the person who had so presumptuously acted upon the long-suffering nature, thinking that eventually I'm going to get him, when finally the long-suffering got him. The world says, don't get mad, get even, or do unto others before they do it unto you. But a long-fused evidence of the Holy Spirit is that which we can view throughout all of history as something that God has so wonderfully blessed. It's the way he continues to interact with you it's the way he interacts with me, and it's the evidence of his spirit in you interacting through others. One of Abraham Lincoln's earliest political enemies was a man named Edwin Stanton. Stanton said, honestly, some horrific things about Abraham Lincoln. He called Lincoln a low cunning clown. He called Abraham Lincoln the original gorilla. He said it's ridiculous for people to travel to another continent to see a gorilla when they could stay right here and see Lincoln. Lincoln never responded to the slander. Even when as president he needed a secretary of war, he chose Edwin Stanton. When his friends who were incredulous at that decision, when his friends asked him if he was mad, what is the reasoning behind this, this decision, Lincoln simply replied, because he is the best man. Years later, when Lincoln was shot in Ford's theater, he is taken across the street to a small home, and there Lincoln bled and died. Stanton arrived very quickly. He sees the president's ashen and lifeless body, and these are the words reported that Stanton said through tears. There lies the greatest ruler of men the world has ever seen. What a change of heart. And I would submit because the long fuse gave space and long suffering won. Who do you consider to be in this life one of your greatest adversaries? Who is it that can seem to set you off like no one else can? There's only one thing that provides an answer for it. Only one thing. That is the evidence of the spirit produced from heaven, seen on earth, that is called the long-suffering evidence of the filling of God's Holy Spirit. So let me ask you as we close, are you short-fused? Do you seem to have this ability to just explode rather quickly? Is there someone in your life with whom you have simply run out of patience? If God has still given them breath to breathe, then he is still waiting, still calling, still offering them space to return to him. The only question is, are you offering the same? And then finally, are you presuming upon the long-suffering patience of our gracious Lord? I believe that's possible for both the saved and the lost. Do you know Christ personally? Yes, I do. Are you acting in a manner presumptuous regarding the long-suffering aspect of God as it pertains to your sin? 
You say, well, I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. Oh, I know that. But how presumptuous it is for a child of God to live in a manner inconsistent with their father and think that it goes forever unjudged. Or maybe today you do not know Jesus Christ personally. You know of him. You may have been aware of him for years, but you have not yet come into a personal saving relationship with Jesus the Lord is not slack concerning his, his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us. Why? Because he's not willing that you should perish. He is desirous that you should come to repentance. No matter what your position is today, if God the Holy Spirit is addressing a matter of presumption, you're presuming upon his long-suffering nature Hebrews 4, 7 says, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Lord, develop in us a spirit that is like yours. That of one who suffers long is not short-fused. And then, if there are those who have not yet come within the space of that fuse to a saving knowledge of Christ, would you come to him even today? We're glad you joined us for Rejoice in the Lord as we've discovered answers to life's questions from God's Word. Messages are also available on iTunes when you search Rejoice TV or find us on YouTube by searching Rejoice in the Lord. Your financial support is vital to keep Rejoice on the air. Your tax-deductible gift enables this viewer-supported ministry to spread the gospel around the world. Encouraging Christians and reaching people for Jesus. This is Rejoice in the Lord.